All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. If you've been tuning into Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants this month, you know it's February. February is one of our favorite months here. Every February, we kick all the men out for the month, and we host women in science, exploration, adventure, and conservation from all over the planet. It's been an awesome month so far. I can't believe we only have two uh, days of events left, but they are jam-packed days. So do head over to exploringbytheseat.com and you'll find at least four or five uh, events that you can still join into with your classrooms. So today is a great way to start things off. We are heading to the Philippines where we are joined by K.M. Reyes. She is a community organizer and conservationist based on Palawan Island in the Philippines. She is the co-executive director and co-founder of the Environmental Organization Center for Sustainability, PH. So through this organization, she helped spearhead the declaration of Cleopatra's Needle Critical Habitat. So this protected 41,350 hectares of some of the Philippines' last remaining uh, primary forest. Her work is driven by the belief that if you connect with communities uh, and connect them to their surrounding environments, it can help us find sustainable solutions for our planet and some of our greatest environmental challenges. So I'm gonna bring KM in with us live. KM, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Good morning to you and good evening from us. <laughs> All right. Well, it's great to have you joining us live from the Philippines today. We have a bunch of classrooms joining us live via YouTube from Canada and the US. They're saying hi in the chat. So just a shout out to them and a reminder, let's save the chat space after you say hi uh, for some questions. And then all of our camera classrooms, we've got a great group of camera classrooms joining us who are gonna fire some questions your way. Brilliant, okay. Do I have the floor officially? You have the floor, it's all yours. <laughs> Perfect, okay. Well, thank you everybody for um, coming in, tuning in tonight or this morning from your end. Um, greetings to North America. From um, the Philippines, Palawan, in specifically, which is an island in the far western Philippines. It's actually closer to Borneo than it is to the capital city, uh, Manila. So, as you probably hear from my accent, I'm actually um, I'm very lucky in that I'm Australian Filipino. So, growing up has been a little bit richer for me culturally. Um, so, I was born and raised in Australia, but both of my parents are Filipino, and I've been here now in the Philippines for about seven years. A woman working in science and exploration, um, and yeah, hopefully, and um, inspire you to find out why it's such a nice place and why we should be protecting the Philippines. So to do that, then I'm going to share a little presentation. This thing works. StreamYard share. Oh, no. Sorry. I think I'm just sharing myself. So, KM, okay, um, while you are sharing. <laughs> uh, stop um, screen. Sorry. That's hey, okay. Guys, it's a bit late here. You have to forgive me. I'm trying to figure it out. Here we go. Okay. Got it right. This time. Alrighty, is this working? Here yeah, okay, so that's me. So I'm gonna jump straight in and first know where you guys are in North America. Um, the countries in green are some of the countries that I've lived in. I've been very lucky. I'm a very typical Aussie in that I've uh, been to many places. We tend to like to travel a lot. Um, and then on the very right hand side, hopefully you guys can all locate where the Philippines is. I don't have a little pointer, um, but it's just that little, little island just above uh, Australia. And we're looking at uh, over 7,000 islands. Um, so I'm gonna jump straight into the Philippines. It is one of 17 mega diverse countries in the world. There's only 17. And once upon a time, about 500 years ago, Go, our forests or our island was actually 95% covered in uh, pristine rainforest. Um, and actually, our big claim to fame is that the Philippines harbors the highest concentration of vertebrate diversity on Earth. What this means in layman terms or lay people terms is that in one square meter of 
Philippine land, you'll see more diversity of fauna and flora than anywhere else on the planet. So we're just teeming with life here. And I'm just going to run you really quickly through some fun photos of some of the wildlife you might see here. One horned frog. We have the Palama pangolin or the Philippine pangolin, which you might have heard of already, or the Philip or the pangolin in general. Sam, can you hear me? Which is actually the number one poached animal in the world. And for a couple of months, it was um, recognition of possibly because of COVID-19 before they realized that it was actually the bat. Um, but this is actually a really high value species for its scales. And we have it right here in Palawan. We okay, so um, we're gonna get KM to try and redo her connection. Um, sometimes in the Philippines, depending on the time of day, the connection uh, doesn't always cooperate. So sometimes her just coming back into the call uh, will help us get things back on track. Um, I don't think she could hear me. So I gave her a little nudge out of the studio to encourage her to come back in uh, and try again. So we'll just give her a moment to get back in with us. Um, and then we'll see. We hosted her last week for an event and we were okay with the connection. So let's see when she comes back in, if we get lucky again. So just bear with me for one second while I reach out to her uh, quickly. Uh, KM, how are you? Hi, how long have I been offline for? I think I was just talking and talking for ages and then I went, wait a minute. You I were, you were I, I actually just called Wes uh, to get your number. So I have your, your WhatsApp, <laughs> so I can call you if that happens again. Um, your signal was so good to start and then right when you launched into the screen share, uh, we lost you. So it's really clear right now Okay, I'm on a hot spot. I'm officially on a hot spot. <laughs> okay, do you want to try and share your screen again? We'll see if we can get uh, we sure. can get things rolling. Sorry, okay. KM. I, I tried. Uh, no, that's okay. That's okay. Am I? So did 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 the whole did all the classrooms just not hear any of what I just said for the past five minutes? Unfortunately, the with the screen share, I think it it you couldn't hear us because I was trying to get you to to pause so we could try and 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 reload. Okay. So, so we did miss most of it, unfortunately. No images. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm going to. It's technology. Sometimes. I know. And here in the Philippines, it's like even yeah. more special. Okay. So All can right. you shout out to me? Like, is that? Because I can hear you right now. It looks good. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so am I just going to start from the very beginning again? I'm so sorry to North America. It's not my fault. It's the Philippines. We're on a remote island. Internet is a little bit patchy. <laughs> I think the classrooms understand. It's just awesome we get the chance to be with you this morning. <laughs> okay, I'm going to launch it again. Okay. <laughs> All righty. 
Okay, so starting again, I went through like 15 slides before I realized. But to start again, I'm Karina. I think I've already told you before that I'm Aussie Filipino. That is the reason why you have this funny accent of mine. Um, very briefly, these are the different countries where I've tra traveled, the countries in green, not the ones in brown. And today we're going to hone in on the Philippines, which is a little bunch of islands there just above Australia. Um, and the Philippines is a super special country because it's one of only 17 mega diverse countries in the world. And originally we were covered 95% in virgin or pristine rainforest. So it's a super special place, very close to my heart, obviously. And really importantly, the Philippines actually harbors the highest concentration of terrestrial biodiversity on Earth. So what that means is that in one square meter of Philippine land, you will see more diversity of fauna and flora than anywhere else on the planet. So it's really incredible. I'm going to run you through some of the wildlife, this amazing wildlife um, that you can see here in the Philippines. So we have the Palawan monitor lizard. We have the Palawan horn frog, very charismatic species. We also have the Philippine pangolin, which is very well known, the pangolin itself, for being the number one poached animal in the world. There are eight different species around the world, uh, specifically in Africa and Asia. And here in Palawan, we're very lucky to be one of its homes. We also have this super cute critter, the Asian small clawed otter, and finally the Philippine eagle, which is our national, um, which is our national bird, national animal. But unfortunately, despite all this amazing wildlife, we now only have 3% of pristine Philippine forests left. So the race is on. So with my team, we are the Center for Sustainability PH, a women-led youth environmental nonprofit from Palawan Island, known as the Philippines' last ecological frontier. And I'm just going to point out to the very right-hand side is Otaniel, one of my colleagues, and he was just 17 years old when we first uh, started our project to establish our first national park that I'm going to tell you a little bit about later. And by the time he was 21, we had our first national park. The point of me telling you this is that you can start in forest conservation in really ambitious projects to be a change maker at any age as Otaniel has shown us and basically so you know uh, this is our mission it's to conserve land and we want to protect the Philippines last three percent of remaining rainforest so from there I'm going to show you exactly where we are so the Philippines is on the right you can see Manila there we're really far flung on the on the western side we're actually closer to borneo than we are to uh like like quote unquote mainland philippines um and where we work specifically for the last five years now is this beautiful place called cleopatra's needle critical habitat it's the highest peak of our city puerto princesa city it rises to 1593 meters above sea level so it takes about three days to hike to the top and it's the area that we've been able to protect is actually 41 over 41,000 hectares so it's like two and a half times the size of Washington DC so it's a pretty big area if you can imagine the six of us kind of hiking out to this area on our motorcycles uh, trying to get out there doing river crossings on our bikes I've drowned my bike like two or three times. The indigenous communities have laughed so much at me um, for that. Um, and yeah, and so this area is really, really important for a few different reasons. Besides being the highest peak and largest watershed of our city, it's home to the disappearing indigenous Batak tribe and also home to countless endemic and threatened species. The area is actually largely unstudied. So if any of you are budding biologists and one day want to come over and do your research with us, you're more than welcome to help us find, do more discoveries to science because a lot of the area still hasn't been as researched as much as we'd like to. So I'm going to take you through a little bit how you establish a national park because in Australia, and I think it's also the same in um, the US, generally national parks happen through a designation from 
from our government. And that's also the case here in the Philippines. But how does that happen? Like, how does the government decide to do it? So here in the Philippines, it's happened because of a small team like ours that's decided that we want to do it. And it's a legal process. So I'm going to take you through the steps of the, you know, how a national park comes to be. So the very first step is community organizing. So this is my colleague here, Jessa in pink. If you can imagine, she was in her very early 20s when we first started this project. And she was talking with mostly male leaders that were two to three times our age when we first started this project and trying to talk to them about what we wanted to do and why we wanted to protect the area. And we felt that it was important. And with community organizing and getting consent from the communities, because these are the people that live in this forest and depend on the resources all the time, um, it's, it's a whole process and we have to talk to lots of different groups that depend on that forest, especially one as big as Cleopatra's Needle. So we work with women, we, work with, we also work with uh, teenagers, we work with kids, we work with, this is Mother Olinda, who's a very important leader for me. Uh, she was really integral in pushing the communities to jump on board and, and protect the area. A lot of indigenous communities are scared that once the area gets protected, that they will no longer have access to their land. And she was one of the people that really helped us and worked with us to help us understand better how to communicate. And also for the indigenous peoples to understand that we were doing this together, and that they were going to be a major decision maker once we protect the area. We work with kids. We work with leaders. And we also, very importantly, do a lot of our community organizing at night. As you can see here, my colleague Jess are in the red basketball shorts on the left. She's kind of in her pajamas already because we're working with our communities really late at night after they've finished work. Um, and they have more time to think about really important things like what they want to do with, with the land that they depend on so closely. And another part of the work that we do as part of community organizing is to teach the communities or show the communities how we work. And so what we do is besides this really big project of creating, you know, this really enormous national park, we do smaller projects on products that really matter to them. And one of them is this tree called the Anmasiga tree. And there's lots of problems with this tree because it's got, um, it produces a really high value resin that the indigenous communities tap like they, like you would tap rubber for example and they sell it but when you over tap or over harvest the tree it ends up falling it ends up dying from unsustainable harvesting and so basically what happened is that we worked with indigenous communities to propagate and reforest their ancestral land with this tree and it's the first time that it's ever happened and for the indigenous communities, as a real learning process as much as it was for us. If you take a little look here to the very left hand um, picture, to actually collect the seeds to propagate this tree, we have to climb up to the very top. So it's like 60 to 70 meters. There's a whole safety training that goes with it. It's a really arduous process. It takes about two years from the time we collect the seeds to the time that we actually uh, reforest it back into the area and we're super happy because as part of the work that we did um, organizing our communities and getting to know them better and building relationships together we were able to achieve the reforestation of 15,000 seedlings of this disappearing tree species so after we did the community organizing and they say okay we're on board we want to you know we want to work with you to protect the land then we get to do the really fun part which is research and this is the part that a lot of people get really attracted to because this is where you get to, you know, see lots of really amazing wildlife and adventure out into, you know, really deep forests uh, where there's no internet connection, there's no electricity, it's just you and the elements. So this is a really typical uh, base camp. As you can see, we just have like, like plastic tarps basically um, and then we're sleeping in hammocks. Uh, to get up to our base camps, it's a, like a really serious hiking. It takes about two to three days to get up there and we go fully loaded. We have to usually do about, you know, 20 to 50 river crossings depending on the season. And then once we get up there, we get to study all sorts of different species. So this includes birds. This includes aquatic insects. It includes herpetofauna, so snakes, uh, birds, um, uh, frogs, lizards. We also look at mammals 
And then from there, we also have to preserve these species once we collect them. And this is a really important part of the process because we do DNA testing um, with these species also. We're able to keep holotypes at the National Museum of the Philippines and that way other scientists can come and have a look and understand the species better. Another really big part of the work that we do in research is try to make as many discoveries to science as possible because this is a good way for us to later on convince the really important decision makers at the top that uh, the area should be protected. So these are some of the things that we discover, we rediscovered to science. This is the Malat Gun River Sicilian, which had actually been thought of as extinct for about 50 or 60 years and then we finally saw it again in 2014 so it was a real eureka moment we also saw the palawan toadlet um palawan stick insect is another big discovery we'd never had a specimen of this before um, and this was our first sighting of it and then some other really fun stuff that we do is camera trapping so we set up camera traps on the trees and then we try and capture what footage we can so here we have the Palawan civet. Here we have the Palawan porcupine. Here we have the Palawan leopard cat. And we also have the long tailed macaque. So lots of really fun different species. And then from there, once we have the proof of science and the consent of our communities, the really fun part happens, which is lobbying. Um, and this is where we start knocking on doors to our local politicians to convince them that this area is so important, the local communities support it, and we have to protect it for our future generations. And it's Jess and I who do most of the lobbying at my organization. It's a real struggle because we're in a really remote island and we deal with lots of different kinds of prejudices like sexism, like ageism, because we're very, very young. Uh, so it's been a real hard slog. Um, and it looks a little bit like this. We're in meetings all the time with different kinds of decision makers, trying to convince them basically that they should listen to us. And we did that for about two years. And finally, we were able to convince them to pass the law. And we finally got our law. So it's a, a piece of paper. It seems like a lot of effort just for a piece of paper. But that's a policy that later on, lots and lots of different communities, decision makers, universities, students will follow in order to protect this area. So that's why it's super duper important. And so after that, wrapping up um, with this project, I'm not going to go through all the different interventions that we did over the five years that it took us to protect this area. Um, but there's lots of different things that we did in education, ecotourism, livelihood, enforcement, and we worked with countless different stakeholders. It was a real team effort. I cannot stress that enough. It wasn't just the six of us. Lots of different partners were on board with us for this. Um, and then we were super lucky because in 2019 we were recognized for our achievements as one of the 10 accomplished youth organizations of the Philippines. So that was really, really exciting and just really good kind of recognition for us. Um, and then, but after protecting that, actually it isn't enough. And this is what we were always saying now. Um, there's actually a study that's come out by the United Nations that says that we need to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. And this ensures clean drinking water and a stable global climate. And not just for us, for our children and our grandchildren too. And so we're on a mission now at the Center for Sustainability, PH, to protect more forest. So working with different, this is from the United Nations, this is them telling us that we need to protect 30% of the planet by 2030 lots of other really important environmental organizations that are much bigger than the Center for Sustainability PH also agree with us. Maybe some of these logos are familiar to you. Um, but now we're actually working on a whole new site. Uh, you can't see it here, or maybe you can. It's number 64, if you can see that. So we're at number 61 to 62, that was Cleopatra's Needle. And now we have this whole new project to protect at the very bottom here. So we've got our work cut out for us, but luckily we're a youth organization, so we've got time and energy still on our hands. And just to wrap up, we hope that you'll protect 30 by 30 with us. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more um, 
also about how you can help us with this, if at all you're interested. Um, can you see me? Yes, I think you can. Um, and so basically what you can do is we have a new campaign called the One Million Letters campaign. Where we're basically collecting letters from youth under 26 uh, to support protecting 30% of the planet by 2030 and to write about what they love about nature and why we need to protect it. So for more details about that, hop onto our social media, onto our Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, and you can find out more details about that. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's it. Awesome, Pam. <laughs> that went perfectly this time. So okay, thanks. cool. <laughs> um, loved your presentation. It's always so exciting to see biodiversity, especially from amazing places like the Philippines. Um, and I just love the the idea of you and your team zipping around on the motorbikes in those remote areas and checking things out. <laughs> I think that's so cool. Rain, hail, or shine. We've learned now that that weather can't stop us anymore. At the beginning, it was always like, oh, you know, having to drive through the storms and the rain. Unless it's like a typhoon, we're on it. We're going to keep going. <laughs> All right. Well, you're doing incredible work. It's totally paid off with you know, this huge protected area and it sounds like you're not slowing down. So that's great to hear as well. <laughs> All right, well, let's meet some classrooms. So those tuning in via YouTube, let me give a couple quick shout outs here. Um, it's Dykstra's class in Guelph, Ontario, some fifth graders hanging out with us. We've got Humberview Secondary in Bolton. Uh, who else has said hi so far? Arendelle Secondary in Mississauga. So keep saying hi uh, in the chat and start sending us in some of your questions. For now, let's get to one of our live classrooms, our camera classrooms. Let's uh, let's start off with uh, Mrs. Spiegel's group. They are fifth graders hanging out in Philadelphia. I'm gonna bring her in. They're joining us virtually today. Hey, Hello. Mrs. Spiegel. <laughs> hi. So um, one of our students asked, how do you plan to save 30% of the forest by 2030? So basically that's three step process that um, I showed you earlier. So it requires, it's because it's a legal process, you need to jump all kinds of legal hoops. And so that includes getting, you know, support from your local communities, getting the proof of science, and then after that lobbying it to, to politicians. So the 30 by 30 is an actual international campaign. So actually the National Geographic is part of a big campaign called Campaign for Nature. And they're working with uh, countries from across the globe, convincing them to sign this um, agreement with the United Nations uh, to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. I think at the moment we have about 20 to 30 countries that have already signed up, but obviously we're over 150 countries around the world. The United, Na the United States did already um, sign on, I think about a month ago actually, with Biden coming in, which was great news. I'm not quite sure about the status in Canada. And here in the Philippines, we still haven't signed on yet. So we've got our work cut out for us. But basically what happens is the government um, agrees to do it. And then smaller groups like us basically partner with the local governments to take to do the legal steps in order to protect the areas. And not just on paper, but later on working at the front lines at the forest areas with the communities that are directly in charge of managing these forest resources. All right. Um, I can confirm that Canada definitely has signed on um, and also committed to plant 2 billion trees as well. Um, wow. By Amazing. 2030. We so could learn from you. <laughs> do it. Uh, good stuff. All right. Well, let's grab another classroom in uh, and grab their question. So we're going to go to Miss Lawrence's group this time. Grade seven and eights joining us. Let's pop them in. The oh, no. sixes. Oh, sixes. Savvy four. All right, how are you doing? I'm not seven, eight. Um, all right, so our, we, we have two questions. What it, um, my first question is, what will happen if the land, uh, sorry, what will happen if the locals don't agree for you to protect their land? And the second one was, do you plan on planting more seeds around the world? Okay, 
The first question, that is a brilliant question to whoever asked that. Um, what Basically what happens is that if we don't convince the communities that the area should be protected, then we have to respect them, especially because they're the ones that are dependent on the area um, and live in the area. So we have to respect their decision. Um, we actually did, ha that did actually happen to us with our first protected area at Cleopatra's Needle. It was a very, very hard lesson for us to learn, very heartbreaking. And we just had to be better uh, community organizers. We had to be better lobbyists. We had to be better spokespeople and advocates. And luckily that was out of 11 communities um, we were able to bring in 10. And so that 11th community has ended up getting uh, help to manage their land through another recognition as an Indigenous people. So the area isn't lost at all, but unfortunately they're no longer working with us. Um, yeah, so basically we just have to do, we have to work harder uh, next time. We learn from what we didn't do right, and then we apply those lessons for next time to get as many more communities on board. And for the second question, uh, yes, we're definitely doing more reforestation efforts. We're doing it at our new area in southern Palawan that I pointed out at the very end. Um, and we are also shooting for the same, about 15,000 seedlings, if we can, with working with our local communities. All right, great stuff. So we've got a few more saying hi on YouTube. We've got a homeschool in Auburn, Alabama. We've got, um, well, say Miss Oakville, grade seven sixes from Oakville. Uh, and then we've got a travel tourism class who sent in a great question. They're wondering, how does the protection you're doing tie into ecotourism in the area? Definitely does. So one of the early initiatives that we did was actually train the local indigenous communities um, as ecotourism guides. Uh, and so they're, they're trained to do it. And it's a really big part of the revenue, actually. Uh, I mean, at the moment, it's still early days in the kind of management planning for the area. But the long term plan is definitely to bring in um, tourists, whether they're locals or internationals. It's an amazing place. It's, you know, it's pristine rainforest. You have, you know, pristine watershed. It's amazing birding opportunities, incredible wildlife, and this incredible hike all the way to, you know, heaven, basically, or 1,600 meters above sea level. So it's, you know, for any kind of adventure or explorer, it's, it's a real mecca. Okay. Uh, sounds awesome. Uh, let's mm -hmm. jump to another live group. Let's go to Miss Ball's crew in Godrich, Ontario. Let's bring them into the call. There we go. How are we doing, Godrich? We're good, Joe and KM. Uh, I just wondered how you um, started <laughs> off, how you got involved with co-founding this organization, and also um, where do the finances for something this big come from? How do you how do you work to get these seedlings? Where does the money come from to run something like this? Great question. So. Uh, as I've already established, and you can hear, I'm Aussie. The rest of my team, the five others, are actually born here, born and raised here in Palawan. And so basically what happened was I came to do like a return to country, fell in with this group, and they had this dream to protect their backyard. And so we started talking and, and we basically decided that, you know, we wanted to try and protect this area. And my background personally is um, fundraising and working in nonprofits and writing grants. So basically what we did was we you know, developed a project proposal and then we pitched it to different environmental funders. And we were very lucky to get support uh, from, at the very beginning, kind of like the seed funding was through uh, an organization called Rainforest Trust, which is based in Virginia, uh, together with Global Wildlife Conservation. Uh, and then from there, they kind of got us started. And then later on for like the really major project, like, uh, the, like the reforestation project, we worked with Fawn and Flora International, which is a big UK uh, fund, funding organization, and also some local 
uh, groups here in the Philippines. So it's a lot of, I we spent a lot of time, um, well, I spent a lot of time writing grants uh, and trying to find new and different ways to fundraise and get support. With that One Million Letters campaign, actually I forgot to say earlier, that we have matching support. So for every letter that's submitted, uh, we have donors that will match it with three dollars so that's already a huge part of our fundraising different like different kinds of people coming in and chipping in for for different parts um, and then the second question I've already forgotten what was it again I think I answered it it was about the trees wasn't it Whoops, I'm on mute. Yeah, I, I think you got it, Cam. They were curious, you know, what got you into what you're doing in the first place? And then a little bit about the funding. How do you fund such a big project to get uh, and money for the saplings and, and everything else that you do? All right, let's grab another live question and then we'll head back to YouTube after this. So let's go, Mr. Lowings Group. They are in the Durham region. Grade six is hanging out with us. Let's bring him in representing his virtual class. How are we doing? I'm a grade six virtual class over in uh, Durham there. Um, several of my students were wondering about how your research was impacted by COVID. Was, did it make it easier, harder? It made it impossible. <laughs> it's been really hard, actually. So basically, if you can imagine, we were in the middle of an expedition in March last year when our lockdown came down in the Philippines. And if you can imagine, we're like 10, 15 days in the forest, no signal, nothing. And we actually went down and we got down to the highway and there was just nobody. Like there was nobody around. We didn't understand what was going on. It was like a, you know, a whole new world. Uh, and since then, we basically have not been able to get back into the communities. Um, so that's like a year now. Uh, and every single time we thought we were going to go in, um, we haven't been able to because of because of COVID it keeps I mean it's like you know in North North America what's going on where it's up and down so a lot of the work that we've been doing at the moment is advocacy we've been spending a lot more time on social media reaching out to different folks who are interested in supporting our work we've been doing a lot of um, sorting through data what also happens is you know we collect so much data uh, throughout our expeditions, but we don't also always have time to go through it all. So we've been doing a lot of data analysis on this time. Um, yeah, and at the moment we're trying. We're actually trying to get back in next week officially. So everybody, cross your fingers that we can get back in next week. All right, lots of fingers and hopefully toes as well being crossed uh, across North America. Yeah. It'd be great if you're able to get out, <laughs> see how the communities are doing, and of course, you know, continue that ambitious goal. Uh, for 2030. Uh, okay, I said I'd go back to YouTube. Let's see if we've got another, oh yeah, lots of questions. So let's see. Um, so uh, Humberview Secondary School, they are wondering what kind of post-secondary, so what kind of college or university education could help lead to doing this kind of work? Um, okay, so I'm going to say two things. Firstly, the number one thing that you need for this kind of work is passion uh, and, a, and a real commitment um, because it's really hard work. We spend a lot of hours uh, doing this kind of work, working with people that don't necessarily want to be working with us, that don't want to listen to us. And what's always shone through is our passion. And that's a big way that we've been able to change hearts and minds. Um, and also to be really clear, a couple of our team members haven't studied, um, haven't done formal university education, and yet they're so impactful. There's, diff there's various reasons why they haven't studied. Uh, economics is very hard here also, so that's another big thing. But if you want to get into this kind of work, I always say figure out what your passion is first, whether that's you know photography or art or biology or like me, political sciences, and then you make your passion about forest conservation. So some very typical ways of getting in is doing, you know, an environmental course or environmental management, environmental science, doing biology course, 
There's lots of really amazing conservation courses out there now that you can do. But, you know, like me, my background is political sciences because I really look at, at conservation as, as policy driven. I see that as the backbone for all of our work. And so my background tech isn't actually technical or scientific. And I've learned that along the way on the job. So, yeah, I think I would always say that rather than pursue specifically like, you know, you might not be a biologist, but you feel like you need to do a biology degree to get into conservation. That's not the case. Figure out what you're passionate about first and then make it about conservation. All right. I'm going to bring in Miss Fennessy's grade seven and eights and see if they have a question for us. If you're still there, seven eighths, can you unmute the mic for us? We can't hear you if you are there. Okay, well, I'll keep an eye out and see if I see that mic unmute. Uh, but for now, let's grab a question from YouTube here. So uh, where did the name, this is from Humberview, uh, where did the name Cleopatra's Needle come from? Great question. So Cleopatra's Needle actually refers to the peak because it's a real obelisk. It's very, very pointy. So it refers to, to the obelisk, Cleopatra's Needle, which we also have in Egypt. And that's an English name that was given by the American military when they had bases here in Palawan. But I will mention that Cleopatra's Needle also has an indigenous name, which is Puyos Ni Ibai. And it basically means it refers to the peak still, but it actually it actually refers to the head, the head bun of a woman. And the indigenous people, they believe that the, the peak is actually the head, the bun of their mother, the mother of, of the Batak people. So that's the other the other indigenous name for it. All right. Very cool. Uh, we've got a couple minutes. So let's visit a couple of our camera classrooms. So. Let's see, let's check our GDSB virtual school. Do you have a, another question for us from the sixes? We sure do, we got lots of questions. Um, they were wondering, since you're out in the rainforest a lot and out in the forest, have you developed any survival skills and have you had any uh, situations that were dangerous or life-threatening? Um, hmm. Survival skills. Well, the, one, the number one thing is you never go anywhere alone. That's a really big part, we always, go accompanied by our indigenous communities um but we have definitely had workshops in like how to start a fire like with with just wood like with two pieces of wood um how to collect water from the river you can you can filter water just using stones if ever you run out of water um but generally we always go accompanied uh with with indigenous guides always it's a form of respect and also for us to make sure that that we're protected all the time all right miss spiegel's crew did the fifth graders have another question for us yes they do um what did you do with the rediscovered species or who did you tell that you found them and what happens with them yeah, great question. So what happens is we collect a specimen of it and then we preserve it and then we give it over to the National Museum of the Philippines because this is what we consider na like national patrimony. It belongs to the people of the Philippines and it should be something that anybody from anywhere in the Philippines and even outsiders can come and see. So that's where we handed it in. And then we wrote reports about the discovery and we published it on the internet and um, even like on National Geographic and different places. And then from there, we would show that to politicians to convince them that this area is really, really special and has to be protected. All right, Ms. Dykstra's class tuning in with us online. They're wondering how long have you been in the Philippines and um what species do you think might be the most endangered or you know the smallest number of so i came to the philippines in 2014 for the first time ever in my life and then i ended up meeting this wonderful group um with whom we started the center for sustainability ph and so then i just never left and i've been i've been there ever since or i've been here ever since um and in terms of 
like critically endangered species. We have quite a few. We have the Philippine pangolin, which, as I mentioned before in my presentation, uh, is the number one poached animal in the world. So that's you know very high up on our conservation list of, of issues that we need to tackle. Um, and then we also have various critically endangered species. Uh, we have like many cycads, which I'm not sure if you're aware of, but if you ever see pictures of dinosaurs, uh, you'll see that they always have these plants kind of in the background. And these are cycads. They almost look like ferns and they're actually the oldest living um, plant, seed bearing plant in the world. Like they've been around since the dinosaurs. And we have many of those and they're often dug up, if you can imagine, and then sold uh, like a poached animal is. They're, they're seen as like a, a prized plant. Um, yeah, so those are, those are two very big, important, critically endangered species. Yeah, I'm glad uh, you mentioned that because, you know, when we do think of poaching, we think of animals. We think of uh, pangolins or rhinos or elephants, but uh, plants, I mean, there's a big black market for rare plant species as well. Huge. Yeah. Okay, uh, Miss Ball's crew, Godrich, do you guys have another question? Yeah, I was wondering, you were mentioning the poaching, and I wondered how much um, sort of policing or protecting um, animals in that way is part of your work in protecting a forest, or does it just come under the realm of the new legislation that you got passed? How does that work? Yeah, so in the lead up to the legislation being passed, we actually trained uh, 39 Indigenous and local community members to be wildlife enforcement officers so that they could actually patrol the area um, once the area was protected. And the training was done by the government agencies in line with, with environmental leg legislation. So they've been patrolling that area uh, ever since, and they do that either on their, on their days off or, you know, we also organise allowances for them from time to time to do that. Uh, the management board now is slowly taking over that role. And it's been, from what we've seen, it's been quite, a, it's been very effective, like from when we first started to now, especially because they do, they're able to control cho choke points where illegal like poachers and different kinds of um, people can can get in and do illegal activities. Okay, and one more visit, Miss Lawrence's class. They had a really good question in the chat, so um, right in line with our theme for the month. So, Miss Lawrence, if you want to ask that question, it's a great question to wrap us up. Thank you. Um, has it ever been hard for you to protect the environment due to being a girl? Have you ever fought for women's rights because of this? Huge, hugely hard. <laughs> it's really, really, really hard. Um, where do I start with, with this question? Uh, the Philippines is extremely patriarchal. And so on, on every level, basically we face discrimination. Uh, we've been, I've been told that, um, that field work isn't an appropriate isn't an appropriate um, job for for a woman. Uh, I've been told how to dress. I've been asked on my marital status in the middle of, of a board, like a very important board meeting. Uh, I've I've also um, experienced like you know just different forms of discrimination uh, for being a woman. And the irony is that or kind of what's been interesting is it's it's really been since living here that I've become so much more staunch about women's rights and supporting other women, encouraging young women conservationists and other young women change makers to really make a difference because really on all levels, we are discriminated against um, here. And so it's a really big part of, of the work that we do. And we spend a lot of time trying to encourage young women to come out and join us and be a part of it and to, you know, get outdoors and feel stronger uh, because of it. But yeah, it's definitely an ongoing struggle that we face every day. And which is why, you know, months like this where we get to celebrate um, being a woman and, you know, our contribution is really, really important. All right. Well, KM, uh, you are a trailblazer. Thank you so much uh, for the work you do and yeah. continuing to do it despite, you know, challenges. 
there are challenges. And as you mentioned, sometimes uh, things don't go well the first time, but it's learning from those mistakes and pushing through uh, to keep going. That makes a huge difference. So huge shout out to the work you're doing to your team uh, who, you know, you've mentioned multiple times, sounds like an incredible group that you get to work with. Uh, and yeah, we're all pulling for you and hoping you can get back out in the field and doing what you do best. Yeah. Next week. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you to our uh, camera classrooms. Thank you to the YouTube classrooms. So many great questions. Let's just pop everybody back in just briefly so they can give a big wave. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, lots of fun. Cam, we can't wait uh, to catch up maybe later in the year and see how you're doing. Yeah. Definitely. I'd love to give more updates. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We're going to sign you. off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.